feels grand. But what I'm going to tell you is that um, one of the really fortunate things that we have and has been growing is a community of people who are doing great work in and around this area who are invested in the community. And so that's what we're going to have today. That's what we're going to explore tonight. Who's out there? Who's doing the work? Um, and this is really meant to be a conversation. So please feel free to add and, and ask questions. Um, I know we compared with the river and the water, 2002 to 2017. And, uh, and really, what one of the big changes between 2002 and 2017 are these people sitting in front of you. Firewise didn't even exist in 2002. That was what inspired Firewise. So uh, we're, we're in a better spot in, in a lot of ways. So with that, we'll have the conversation piece. What I'm gonna ask, instead of me trying to introduce everybody, is we'll uh, go down the row. Everybody will give their name, who they're with, uh, and what their role is, and then, uh, and then we'll start any conversation. So uh, we'll start with you, Mr. Bukaru. Who are you? Who are you with? And what is your role? Good evening. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I was talking to someone earlier. It's kind of fun in this town of recreation and adventure to have a science evening. So we appreciate that there's plenty of people out there who still appreciate science. Uh, yes, my name is Jim Buick Rood. I'm the uh, Lands and Forest Protection Program Manager for San Juan Citizens Alliance. And just Briefly, um, so the Alliance has been around for about 30 years, and part of our involvement in all forest issues has to do with uh, public involvement and just transparent public processes so people can be involved and we get a lot of information on the table. Um, that's always been one of our big pieces. Um, I'll also say that um, you know we are in harmony uh, generally with the three-legged stool that the Forest Service talks about, which is the social, the economic, and ecologic, um, we find ourselves often in the role of making sure the ecologic voice is heard. Um, many times in our community here, the social voices or the economic voices are the loudest, or sometimes the political push is. Uh, so it's, we feel it's one of our uh, important pieces to be sure the ecological context is taken care of. Because Generally speaking, if you're not paying in ecology, you're paying for it later, one way or another way, right? And so we feel that's one of our, uh, you know, central um, duties, so to speak, uh, with the uh, with lions and getting people involved in that way. Um, and just, you know, kind of the latter part of that is, um, you know, it's it's my job. Uh, to a certain extent, to poke at various peoples, generally the federal land managers, but they poke back too. But um, to remind them that sometimes uh, we've overlooked the science in the past, or made errors, or haven't made the best decisions. And as you're discovering already tonight, even though it's science, there's a lot of unknownness to it. There's always a little bit of art. There's always controversy. There's you know, a lot of pieces to it. Um, but to remind them that you know we've love a dub dub in places before, and we know where those places are. We can go up and see where there's a, a forest type conversion because we cut uh, either the spruce at too high elevation or too too much of it. Um, you know, there's other other uh, examples of that. So, anyway, so that's pretty much what the Alliance is doing, bringing the kind of the conservation ecologic voice to the table. Not that the agencies, whether it's state, federal, or so forth, don't have um, their scientists at work, but we are not um, bound by uh, the federal government to do certain things. We can be that uh, more fluid advocate voice. Thank you. My name is Matt Chvelviak. I'm the Columbine District Ranger here in the San Juan National Forest. It's really an honor to be here tonight. It's an honor to be sitting on this panel with these distinguished gentlemen here. Um, Jimbo, you do a very good job. <laughs> and a fantastic job. Um, 
and, and I think if you just reflect on the, the Forest Service of the recent past, where we may not have thought twice about going in and doing several thousand acre clear cuts in the spruce zone, and today we think long and hard for even doing salvage logging and where we're doing it on the landscape. So that's a success that, that the Citizens Alliance and other groups I think, can uh, take credit for. Um, it's, it changed the mentality of the agency. The other thing that's changed is the fact that we're here in front of the community tonight talking about fire, talking about forest health, instead of just kind of keeping it all at arm's length saying, no, we got this, we're the experts. Um, just let us work on the land. Uh, that's been a huge change too. And, uh, and so my role in the agency as a district ranger is basically managing about 690,000 acres of your national forests. And that includes the trees, Includes the wilderness areas, the trails, the campgrounds. It's just a whole plethora of things: um, grazing, mining, oil and gas development. It uh, keeps us busy, but it's also an honor to have that role to do it on your behalf. And we look to you to keep us all honest in that. And uh, we've got a lot to talk about as far as fire tonight. So my role in fire is uh, basically listening. You guys, the community defines what is the values on the landscape, then I can take that information with my team and, and other people in the community to make sure that we have things set in place so that we can do our best to protect those values at risk and that we can have good fire on the landscape. That's my role with respect to fire and to keep people safe. Well, my name is uh, <coughs> Kent Grant, and I'm with the Colorado State Forest Service, the other forest service. And uh, we're smaller, but we try hard. And, uh, <laughs> and I work here out of Durango, the Durango Field Office in the Colorado State Forest Service. It used to be the Durango District, and I used to be the District Forester, but we're doing some restructuring, and now I'm a supervisory forester, and, uh, and it's no longer a district, it's a field office, and uh, so. We just like to keep things changing so we confuse people. So, and in relationship to that, you know, this is our old logo. So because we were changing, we had of course get a new logo. So it looks like this, and it's a big one on the center of the screen up there. And I thought we were being really smart adopting an oval logo because it takes more room. Yeah. And, and I think it's the reason tonight is. Uh, we're the sponsor of this, so one of the main sponsor. So uh, I guess that's why they gave us the most space there. Thank you. But anyway, we, we work with uh, uh, we're part of the Warner College of Natural Resources at Colorado State University. We're one of the few uh, forest state forestry agencies that are part of a land grant institution still, like CSU, and uh, we we like that relationship. It's a good fit for us and. We, the State Forest Service, takes a non-regulatory and service-oriented approach to providing technical forestry assistance, wildfire hazard mitigation expertise, and outreach and education to help landowners, communities, and other non-federal landowners or entities achieve their forest management goals. And uh, we're, we're uh, really, uh, oh, we're, we're fairly limited in size, but uh, here in Durango we have three foresters, uh, an administrative assistant who's here tonight, Melissa Simmons, an FIA forester, Drew Clements in the back, and uh, we also have a forest utilization marketing uh, statewide specialist that works out of our office here in the Rainbow. That's, that's pretty much it. So anyway, um, we do help people, especially private landowners, manage their, their forest lands, and we work with wildfire hazard and wildfire hazard mitigation and with defensible space and community wildfire assessments and community wildfire protection plans, we assist with those. And we sponsor Firewise Communities USA, which I believe is now Firewise USA. We have a number of those here in, the, in our area. And we also have some grant programs, both state funded and, and federally funded. And the, most of the federal funds come from the US Forest Service. And there are, uh, but they're given to us to, to pass out and administer. And they help fund some of the forest management. They help fund some of the wildfire hazard mitigation work that's being done in, in the area. And just to 
again, keep you a little confused. Uh, recently, uh, Colorado signed an agreement with the U.S. Forest Service, the Good Neighbor Authority Agreement, which lets the Colorado State Forest Service go out and rape and pillage on federal lands. Well, well wait a minute, that's not right. Uh, and, and usually we, we tell them we're going. We don't, we don't just show up and, and start selling their timber or cutting their trees. But, but anyway, this is kind of different, but it, it has some, uh, it helps the, the U.S. Forest Service get some things done on their, on their lands, especially where there, there's some kind of a nexus to private lands, but not always. But the purpose is to protect water supplies, uh, manage bark beetles, reduce wildfire risk, enhance public safety, improve forest health, and meet uh, other forest management objectives. So we're not going out there willy-nilly and, and uh, playing on the national forest, but we do have a purpose, and hopefully we're doing good work. And if you quit seeing our vehicles out on the national forest, they must not have been happy with what we're doing. But, and another thing we do down here is we really collaborate a lot. So, uh, you know, the, all people here on this, at the table or on this panel are used to that. It's something that I think the southwest corner of the state is really good at. We've gotten, I think, national recognition for that. All the different agencies play pretty well together in the sandbox, and they can't say that of every place. And I think that that's a good thing for, for this part of the state when, when we can do that together. Um, are you tired of hearing me? Okay, I'll go to the next speaker. Uh, my name is Charlie Landsman. I am the La Plata County Coordinator for Firewise of Southwest Colorado. And basically, my role is to help private landowners do whatever they need, uh, or provide the resources they need in order to uh, mitigate the fire risk on their property. When it ultimately comes down to it, um, there's a lot of people up here who are responsible for a lot of area around the county. And everybody out there, um, you're the ones who are responsible for around your homes and within your neighborhoods. And that can't come from the outside, it has to come from within those neighborhoods that drive to reduce your wildfire risk, because ultimately you're the ones who are uh, responsible for, for your property. And we offer resources um, to help you guys get to that point where we are doing everything we can to stay as safe as possible from wildfire. So we basically uh, have a couple of different things that we offer, um, one of which is technical knowledge, um, whether it's uh, myself coming out or one of our partner, agency partners um, or, or one of our other coordinators coming out to your property to look at your uh, home individually or help you develop a community assessment or community wildfire protection plan. We can offer technical expertise to help accomplish that. Um, we also have a number of grant programs. Um, we basically work through a neighborhood ambassador type program where we have representatives in about 50 to 70 um, neighborhoods in La Plata County and a lot more um, in the other counties we work in. And basically through those uh, individuals, they act as liaisons to do outreach within these neighborhoods and kind of drive um, work done within these neighborhoods. And then we come in and um, can help financially with neighborhood scale projects through grants like our Kickstart grant or on an individual level through something like our cost share program or our chipper rental rebate. Um, we also offer a lot of educational opportunities and just two in particular we have coming up on April 21st. We're gonna have a home ignition zone workshop um, which will teach uh, people about what risk factors they should look for around their home. And then on May 5th, we're gonna have a, a wildfire preparedness day fair up in Forest Lakes. If you have either questions about either of those, I'll be around after this and um, please come talk to me. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'm gonna stand up, it makes it a little bit easier for me to talk. I'm Butch Holt, I'm the director of the Platte County Office of Emergency Management and the Platte County Building Department. And I represent the interests, the legislative interests of uh, the Platt County Sheriff and the Board of County Commissioners. <clears throat> Under state law, uh, each of those uh, individuals have certain responsibilities uh, to their citizens within the community. So I'm approaching my 42nd year in May with the Platt County. And I have to say, uh, I think can't hit it on the head, We've worked together for many, many years, but 
there's not enough uh, spotlight, if you will, on the fact that we have agencies in this part of the state that get together. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But it's been an honor to work with all the different agencies that I've worked with over those years. And we truly do have something special in this corner of the state. We truly do respect and work with each other in a manner that is not common through other parts of the country, especially in other parts of the state of Colorado. So with that, a little moment, kind of a confession, OK? I'm ready to question. But when, when uh, we started out, Laurel said that she had a list of experts that were going to speak tonight. And so I don't know. I, I'm not, I don't think I'm there because I got up Sunday morning and I thought, weather service said it's going to be calm. Good day to do some burning. So following the rules that we've kind of put together, I called the 911 center, advised them at 7 o'clock I was going to start burning. And I've burned about 2,000 linear feet of irrigation ditch on my property. Been a lifelong resident of the Andes Valley. Uh, worked on the property, taking care of the property, and believe in fire. Believe in the use of fire. So, well, I'm going to bring. There's too many sad faces in here tonight, so this is going to be a good lap. So I had burned, and by noon, and I think the fire chiefs all tell us we should shut down by noon. Good idea, because the wind always picks up around noon. And I was on my way, I had an out. I was going around spraying some hot spots, and I had one area of concern. I had a 100 foot, 150 foot hose on the truck, and I pulled it out and hosing it down, and I turned my back for about two minutes, three minutes, and a gust, no wind, a gust, came out and kicked some embers out into the field and away it went. And so, as it took off across the field, uh, I called the neighbor, and uh, fortunately they, they came out with one of their big tractors, and between all of my spray equipment on trucks and the tractor, we were able to keep it contained. Scary, frustrating that me and my position lose the fire. But the scariest part of that was the fact that I thought, I'm going to have to face terror. <laughs> if it gets on federal land. I was trying to remember what I read about extradition from New Mexico. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, to be honest and fair tonight, I don't want to bring that up. It's probably going to be in the Durango Herald tomorrow. <laughs> I hope I'm still an expert, but uh, we'll go on from there. So I, I don't know. Do you want me to start out a little bit with what the sheriff does and why we're here, or do you want to do something different, you guys? What do you want me to say? <laughs> I, I can say that I, I know what the sheriff does. Um, <laughs> in regards to fire. Well, in regards to fire, you should probably talk about we, that. I gave it away. How many of you know that the sheriff is the fire warden and responsible for fire in each county in Colorado? Okay, there's a few. So what does that mean to you? That means that you and I have to put tax dollars into a fire. And that law has been really an old one. I think 1952 was one of the first times I read where the legislative people made the sheriff formally responsible, but it goes clear back to 1930, as I remember, was the oldest. I think Ken might agree with me on that. But simple fact is the Board of County Commissioners and the sheriff have responsibilities during large disasters, and the sheriff is the fire warden. So that ties you and I in a financial process to contribute monies to fires within the community. Colorado law uh, has special district laws, and under that special district law, fire districts are created, and they have additional monies then coming in from the uh, bill levy that they place on your property for firefighting efforts. But the simple fact is that sometimes, especially with us in the condition that we are right now with the financial limitations, it's pretty easy for us to run out of money in a hurry. And so, fortunately enough, the state legislatures, I think in 2009, did a remodel. That's kind of where they took Kent and the State Forest Service out of the picture, working with the counties the way they did, and they created the Division of Fire Prevention and Control in, uh, in Denver. And that division then works directly with the sheriffs and with the counties in regards to fire suppression. At the same time, they created additional state monies, which got more uh, equipment and also got aircraft, finally, 
and those aircraft are available to us. There's also other programs within a plan that we will talk about a little bit, but there's also monies that we can tap into from the county to the state level. So it's, it's scary because of the possibility of the financial responsibilities that we have. If we have big fires on private land, uh, probably more financial responsibility from the county to that private effort. But the biggest simple fact goes back to the first statement I made. We have 12 different agencies that sign an annual fire operating plan early on, federal agencies, tribal agencies, state agencies, all fire districts, city of Durango, Clyde County, 12 different agencies come together with a piece of paper and a document that tells us what to do, how we do it, how we share, and how we work together and how we get along. And it truly, truly works. Again, it's better not, because we all get out of the hood of the truck the first night, we make plans for the next day, and we figure it out, and there is a plan in the process. And we go on. So, thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions before I sit down? But I tell you, look, I thank you all for being here tonight. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you all for being a part of the conversation. I do want to acknowledge that we have several other resources in the room. Uh, we can't forget our local fire districts. Thank you for being out here. And so, if we have any questions, these guys can help uh, answer. And we also have the Southern Ute Tribe. And, uh, and as a good neighbor, who's uh, also been a good one to park with. So thank you guys for being here. Um, I, what we'll do is I have an initial question, and then we'll open it up and uh, get questions from the, from the uh, public, from you guys, you, our friends. And, uh, but really, I want to think about you know, to start this, and we're thinking about fire because we looked at the low snowpack and the snow water equivalents, and because we're thinking about our forests and what the what that snow water equivalent might mean for us. Um, you, as community leaders, when we start thinking about fire, when we start thinking about our ecosystems, what is that? What? How does that fire impact affect? our ecosystems, communities, and how we interact. And I'll open it up. I, Jimbo, you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> I'm going to have to wake these guys up periodically. I am awake. Yeah, I think it's probably relevant. I'll go first, and then I'm a, um, you know, different role than some of these other folks are. So I'm just going to, um, Give a couple of reminders here, <clears throat> maybe an admonishment to our species um, as a place to start and why we should be responsible for these things. So let's just remember that the current predicament, while it's not entirely uh, the result of, of what we're doing as a species, a huge amount of it is. Okay. And so in my mind, I think we need to take some responsibility, so get some awareness for that and be responsible for that. So this drought that we're on now, no, none of us were out there building the high pressure out on the Pacific coast that you know kept the storms coming across here. I remember in the larger context, and Aaron pointed to when we're talking about with climate change, it's getting drier and hotter and warmer. So those numbers are all out there. That's the place we're going to. You know, climates, you know, there's information how the climate's affecting the weather, and you know, that's the reality of that. So, when we have pieces, um, right, we're looking at now, I mean, Matt was talking about bugs, like those ponderosa out there that are getting chewed on by the round headed beetles are like, I mean, we might be doing a rain dance, but they're really doing a rain dance because they want some sap to push the beetles out, right? So in the short term, not responsible, but in the bigger term, the way climates change, we are responsible. But the other piece is that, um, you know, let's just take responsibility for is that, you know, Smokey didn't come out of the Lincoln National Forest and start driving forest policy, right? He didn't say, let's suppress those forests. That was a management decision, a policy decision that, you know, back in the time when Smokey, you know, came out of the forest and was picked as the 
the, uh, the guy, the, what do you call the mascot, to suppress everything, let's hop on every fire. We didn't really think that through all the way, right? So we ended up with trying to suppress all these fires, and so we have some places, many places, where we need to have these fuels because we've suppressed uh, fire for so long. So that's a decision we made. I'm trying to get the Forest Service to adopt another mascot, though most of the Forest Service officials don't know this yet, but <laughs> along with Smokey should have come, who's the bear, right? Should have come Blaze, who I think is the fox, right? And he's the happy fire kind of mascot, right? Because he's the fire that's the, you know, where we should have had a loud fire burn in many places even if we were watching it, that would have um, been the fire that would have been into the forest that were used to fires, the custom, that was their natural process, their whatever, the return interval, and so forth like that. But we hop totally in the smoke and wagon, right? And Blaze is just coming onto the scene in 2018 as I introduced him to you tonight. Um, so, just, this is the, that's another choice we made. Now, just one other piece on this one is that you know, for fire managers here, uh, they're not particularly as worried about Main Street Durango, right? They're more worried about the wildland urban interface, the WUI, okay? Now we know that cities do burn, like we looked at the Santa Rosa fire, right? You saw this one in Northern California, you know, that fire came down out of the forest on the eastern side and just took out city blocks. But, you know, a lot of this has to do with the concern about the WUI, Wildland Urban Interface. So, so gee, was there a WUI before we moved into the forest? No, okay? And I'm not talking about, you know, our ancestors who were running around the forest and, you know, temporary conditions, but, you know, we've moved into the forest, right? The forest hasn't come and moved into our communities. So let's take responsibility for the fact that we've created the buoy and all of the problems that go along with it, which has become now, um, I mean the statistics in Colorado especially about how much of us live in the buoy, and is the number going up or down? Up. That is a bad direction, okay? Because for fire managers, right, for forest service officials and so forth, for Kent, I mean, he gives good work for Charlie, but besides that, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not the direction we want to be going, but we're allowing it to do that. So we should be aware of that, you know, uh, those cho choices that we're making. And then what are we doing ab about that, you know? We're putting a lot of money into it. You know, some of those are public funds, some are private funds. But maybe we should think of some other things too, like uh, do we want to draw a line somewhere about, you know, how far we want to keep going into the forest and exacerbating the problem? Or there's some other things, and this is you know, Butch's line, though Butch is, um, you know, he's not at the commission level, but it's these pieces about building codes. Okay? Like, I looked at the house the other day being built in the WUI, and I was like, no, really. Is that really a shape roof? You know? Fortunately, it wasn't. It was a composite roof. <laughs> However, the siding was not stucco, and it was not metal, you know? It was a flammable surface. And did it have gutters? Oops, it had gutters. It didn't need to have gutters, okay? So anyway, I don't know much about building codes at all, but there are things that we can done, we can do if we're gonna, you know, take on this whole deal about Louie that we need to be responsible for those things. So I'm just mostly reminding us that, you know, um, we should be involved, be active, think about these things, the choices we're making, uh, because a lot of the stuff that we're dealing and taking on is of our own making. Especially if you're if you're living in the in the movie, um, and I guess the one last piece about that is that you know not to be too scolding of all of us. I mean, you know, there's a movement for sure. I mean, like Firewise wasn't around a while ago, okay? And now we're talking about um, fire adapted communities. This whole piece of moving in place of like, wow, we live in forests, and you know what forests do now and then? They burn. Okay, so how do we deal with that, you know, in all the ways that we, um, we can? Um, and so that's something that's new. I mean, there's now a national cohesive wildland strategy. Wow, 
That's not something that Smokey came up with, okay? These are more recent things as we're starting to catch on that we need to take on some of these things when we look at the costs, whether it be ecologic, financial, social, and so forth, of uh, fires. And, you know, that graph with fires, I think everyone knows, fires burning per year, uh, acres per year, is, is on the uptrend. Um, okay, so that's, I don't mean to be, I want to take responsibility for it. That's a little bit the bump part. Fortunately, these guys are thinking how to work together to take care of some of the issues. Anybody got anything to add? Fire, community, ecosystem. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. Just a little bit about um, adding to what Jimbo just said is, you know, fire doesn't respect boundaries. Bark beetles don't respect boundaries. And so when, uh, you know, what happens on the national forest can happen on state lands, can happen on private lands. And so one of the efforts we're trying to do more and more, and it's easier said than done, is to work together on landscape or watershed scale projects where we're crossing boundaries and implementing treatments that hopefully will uh, you know, benefit uh, uh, different landowners and, and then the community because we did so. So uh, I, I do have, in this field at least, pretty good job security looking forward, but not necessarily for the reasons I'd like. And the ultimate goal of, of what I do is trying to educate people and build capacity within neighborhoods. Um, it's, it's undoubted that the forests are changing and that we are continuing to expand out into these areas. And with that, we need to promote uh, social change where people are um, feeling more and more that they're responsible for where they're building. I think that there's been a long history um, of emergency managers and fire departments and um, you know government agencies uh, feeling like they want to be able to do anything and passing on that message to the public that you know we'll be there, we'll be able to help. And increasingly, unfortunately, we're seeing that capacity is being exceeded uh, really all across the board. Uh, one thing that I'm running into this year already is there are a lot of people here who want to get stuff done, which is great, but we still have limited resources to get all these things done. And so what we need to do is build capacity within these neighborhoods and within these communities. We need to be realistic and acknowledge the situation we're in now, the future of where we're going, and then build this capacity so that these communities can move towards that uh, fire adapted status where they are really ready to take charge of their own land and prepare for this because we have the knowledge of how homes burn. We didn't necessarily have that 30 years ago. Um, there's been some amazing scientific research uh, done about what actually causes homes to burn and how they burn. And we know what causes that and we know how to prevent that to a big extent. Um, we just have to get to a point where things like either building codes catch up to that knowledge or to a point where um, socially people know what they need to do and are doing that. And you have that? Okay, we'll give it to both. And the question was? <laughs> fire related ecosystems and communities. I thought we were going to talk about the Deer Valley projects a little bit later. Um, you can talk about it. We can talk about it later. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to defer on that one because we have a really interesting case study to share with you as far as a fire adapted community and, and Charlie and I are going to be talking about that a little bit later. So what? Right? Ecosystem? <laughs> fire community budget? Well I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little bit further from what Jim was said and, and he uh, he hit it on the head because what we're doing, I believe personally now is we're speaking the wrong language for the climate change that we're experiencing. And I believe that we do have to go further with codes and regulations. But yet, on the other hand, carrying a radio every day of my life, I hear all of the pages going out to the, to the public safety, energies, fire departments, and law enforcement. I read a lot about disasters and the, uh, the follow-up reports in regards to all the fires that occur across the country. And one thing that's really starting to catch my mind is that these fires are so big, so extreme, the taxes and resources almost instantly. And people have a perception that when they dial 911, there's going to be a bunch of trucks and a bunch of red lights coming into their yard. And you can ask a lot of people in California, that didn't happen. 
And the simple fact is that we can, as taxpayers, continue to pay out all the dollars that we would like to into equipment and personnel. And so that responsibility is gradually trickling down to us as property owners. And I think Smokey Bear should have another part. You know, only you can prevent forest fires. Well, I think the other part of the sentence should be, and only you can prepare and save you and your property and learn how to do that. Because there's a lot of complacency in my mind because people do not recognize today what the changes are and they're in a position where they expect to see somebody come. We do have a sharing process. Uh, Upper Pine on uh, many occasions has gone clear across the county and helped us over on the west side of the county because they have a very limited fire district over there, Durango Fire, Los Pinos. They all share and send equipment to wherever we need it. But I noticed some instances this spring where Durango Fire was paged out in about 15 minutes. Another page went out for Upper Pine and then shortly thereafter another page went out for those Pinos. And all of a sudden those folks are taxed and going to their responsible district, to the people who pay taxes, they hold that responsibility to serve them first. And all of a sudden those entities are taxed. And that's my work. I believe that it's changed to a point weather-wise. We're seeing these extreme conditions. These drought and dry years are happening more common. We used to worry about snow, or we had snow, and worried about maybe one dry year wasn't a lot. Now the dry years are more polluting. So we've got to start talking a different language, and that's what I'm going to try to do here. Thanks, but we'll, uh, we'll come back to our we have uh, some questions that these guys prepared, but does anybody in the audience have anything at this point to ask? So, obviously, the whole interaction, the fact that we, as a community, live within a national forest and we're surrounded by public lands on a lot of areas. The fire that happened out on Lightning Creek, I can't remember exactly when that was, um, but was a very real scenario, and I'm thinking that the response to that, the quick response and the, the ability that living just on the west side of town over here, um, we didn't actually have to evacuate, and there were some people within the city limits who were put on pre back, um, was because we now have greater resources, i.e. We had helicopters and we had planes and, and we had more personnel available right away. Is that a, because we have in some ways responded to changing situations and that sort of thing? We rolled the dice that night and we won. The first night when the fire was coming up over the horizon and very visible, we were starting to make evacuation plans for the west side part of the Durango. There was about six of us that huddled out at the San Juan Public Land Center, and we got our names on all of those aircraft. And the next day, there was a whole bunch of people in Colorado that had fires, and the aircraft were assigned to our fire. And quite honestly, I firmly believe that if it hadn't been for all of those aircraft at our tanker base, ready to go to work, and the air show that went on that day, one plane after another, that finally got that fire into a position where the hand crews and terrain kind of let it die down. But if we hadn't had the planes, uh, it would have been a totally different story. The same thing existed for the Valley Fire in 2002. All the big planes were working and helicopters were working on the east side of the Andes River. And when that alarm went off from the west side in the Valley Fire, uh, it looked like LAX standing out there on the fire line because the soaring bombers were lined up clear to the Needle Peaks making approaches in there. And if they had to have those planes, if they had been on the Hayman fire the way a lot of them had been, we would have lost that fire and would have gone further up the Hermosa Ridge, probably into the Hermosa Canyon, and maybe then even further up the canyon because of the limited resources. So there were opportunities there. But that's the language that I'm talking about. It's a gamble every day. When we get these dry conditions, there are possibilities that we can't respond the way that we need to respond or want to respond. And people need to, need to understand that 
and take their situations in, into their own hands and protect themselves and do some more for themselves to assure that they are protecting their property. So, we're on. Let me just add a little bit here on readiness factor. You know, so where do our winds generally come from? Come on. No more, no more people in the audience know this west and south. Okay, help me out a little bit. Okay, so you know, Matt and I were just talking about this recently and uh, talking about the situation of, you know, I mean, Charlie's working, you know, with homeowners and communities and setting Falls Creek up on the west side. That community has done a whole bunch of work. But the rest of the story is once you get up into the forest and, you know, fires, you know, they can come from any direction, but, you know, you know, they're often coming from that way. And so Matt and I were talking about, you know, what's the status of fuels work, fuels treatment work, and moving on that side. So this is just something for us to be aware of in this community is, is there more work to be done up there on that west side? Is that a priority? How do we pay for it? All those kind of pieces. So, you know, partly pointing that out is there's these different tiers of kind of readiness that, you know, around the homeowner and the next ring out and so forth like that. We, you know, we can't fire or protect ourselves. But, um, you know, there's some readiness that we, you know, the Forest Service Service has done a lot, you know, both state force and the feds, um, but there's still, you know, we still have projects that we can do if we have the money to do it. I'm trying to get Matt to say something that right. <laughs> so to build on that, um, thanks Jimbo, <laughs> wonderful lead-in. Um, so what Jimbo was alluding to was the the wonderful work that was done uh, during the Recovery Act uh, implementation. We did hundreds and thousands of acres of mechanical thinning uh, over on Grandview Ridge, and the City Mountain, um, Parents Peak, that whole area. We did massive amounts of mechanical thinning in the scrub oaks and in the junipers, things like that. Um, that was a decade ago. Things grow. The fuel is back. The deer and elk only eat so much oak over here. So basically, you know, we were we were ready to go and do some follow prescribed burning, but you know, for various reasons, you know, agencies split apart and uh, we no longer were joined with BLM. But we still have to keep our eye on the prize. You know, it's not just a one and done. So when we start, uh, when we do a prescribed burning in one area, we call it a first entry. Uh, we're going to go in very very cautiously, and it's going to be a very you know, low, low, low intensity fire, but we're going to have to go back. And when we do a cannibal thing, we have to go back. And as a community, you have to create those expectations of the agencies that are tasked with man managing that land, whether it's Forest Service, BLM, or Parks and Wildlife, um, anybody, any public land management agency has to be held to that, um, that standard. And again, it's an urban interface. Um, basically, those field treatments were right between the parents' peak for, or the Lightning Creek fire in town. And um, they're, they're losing their effectiveness. And so you're going to have to get back in there and do it. That's just one part of the plot of county that we've treated. And you know, we're going to have to keep returning for all of these other areas, all the other subdivisions. So it's going to be just a constant, I don't want to say battle, but it's just it's, it's one thing. You know, um, on a very large scale. Yeah. It's a kind of a Forest Service question. Um, given that there are hundreds of campsites spread out throughout our forest, if current severe conditions continue, would the Forest Service consider limiting or banning camping this year until we get the necessary moisture? If not, why not? The short answer, would we consider it? To that question, would we consider it? The answer is yes, we would consider it. Um, the San Juan National Forest, to my recollection, and to, to folks that have been around here longer, has never closed as a result of a fire threat. Um, it doesn't mean that it won't happen. Um, and this is something that we're aware of. So, so you got to think about this. We have stage one restrictions when we hit certain criteria. We, we don't have open flames. 
and then we have stage two where there's no addition sources allowed in the forest. Uh, you want to smoke a cigarette, you do it in your truck, uh, those kinds of things. Um, you know, oil and gas will clamp down on welding. There's all kinds of things that go into place. If you're running a chainsaw, you have to have fire extinguishers. All of those things come into place when we hit certain criteria for fire threat. One of the biggest threats that we have is human ignition sources. And you know, if, if, if you look at the Southwest, um, the Santa Fe National Forest or the Carson or, or all of the forests to the Southwest, if they close, where do those people come? They come up here. And that just means we've quadrupled our human ignition sources. And so we have to be aware of that particularly this year. Um, I'm not saying that we will, that's Kara's call, um, but it, it is something that, that we have to consider. I think expanding on that a little bit, how, what preparations given the year that we're looking at, or the conditions we currently have, are there special preparations that folks are taking across the panel for, to get ready? Good, well, I'll, I'll just follow up and then I'll hand off. Um, so preparations, uh, we started talking uh, with Butch and the county commissioners and our partners in, in February. Um, we just said, if, if this does not ameliorate at all, we're, we're in a deep, and we need to start planning for it. Um, and so we, we started those uh, conversations in February brought in uh, FireWise and MSI and said, we need your help, we need to engage the community on this. Um, you know, and, and that's why we're here tonight, that's one of the reasons. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is, um, just kind of, um, I guess, more standard protocol, is when we get to certain conditions on the forest, uh, as far as fuel moistures and um, other things, we put out a call nationwide, we bring in firefighting resources down here. So where they're still seeing snowstorms or, or snow melt coming off in Idaho or places like that, and their firefighters are on duty, but they have nothing to do, we bring them down here. And we, we repositioned them here on the San Juan National Forest um, back in 2012. Um, we hosted over 850 firefighters from places like Minnesota, Oregon, Washington, other places back east. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's one of the things that we'll be looking at this year. I don't know if we're going to go past that many resources, but it, it just all depends. And we treat it very, very seriously. So if we do see a lightning storm come through and we have these firefighting resources, we know where to put them on the forest. So it's all pretty well organized. That's just one of the things we're going to prepare for. So, um, you know, FireWise is in an interesting position because we're a, a nonprofit, and so we have to oftentimes think, you know, years ahead for what programs we want to have supported. Um, basically, years like this, we have a whole lot more interest than we do normal years, but we don't necessarily have more resources available in order to uh, try to do that outreach. So we have to kind of shift our mission to more community approach, uh, things like going in and, and trying to set up educational opportunities for um, whole, member, whole communities rather than going home to home um, and, and really trying to make sure that when we do have these educational opportunities and we are putting on these larger scale events that people are coming to them and interested in them so that they can take that message back. And we really end up relying more and more on those community members who are our neighborhood ambassadors. And once again, making sure that those neighborhood ambassadors are engaged and they're taking the lead on what they want done within their community, and we're there to help them accomplish that when they reach that wall that they can't get past or that barrier that they need help with. So um, really, for, for me, I'm calling on you guys, and I'm calling on those community members who are already engaged and working to get more people engaged because, um, you know, I cover a two-county region. I also work up in San Juan County, and um, without our neighborhood ambassadors, we can't get this stuff done. As Matt pointed out, we've started talking very early this year, and in respect of what the Platte County is doing, the sheriff is redirecting his deputies and, and uh, creating structure within the uh, uh, road patrol so that we can respond quicker and get de deputies out in there to do traffic control evacuations and things like that. Internally in county government, we're restructuring 
and firming up a structure we already had and we're getting more people, more department heads involved out of uh, the different divisions of the county government so that we can shift staff necessary to go into support for evacuation centers and things like that. I remember during the Lightning Creek fire, uh, one call that I got, kind of panic stricken, came from the tanker base operator, and we had so many planes and so much slurry going out of the tanker base out here at Platte Field that they ran out of water. And I received that call, and we completely re-diverted all of our Blue Ridge uh, water trucks. We started delivering over 35,000 gallons of water an hour uh, to support those aircraft so that they could stay in the air and do what they needed to do on the western horizon. So we're very conscious, uh, and I think what Charlie says is very important. The public needs to become very conscious of what's going on and start developing plans. Uh, what's going to happen? Be conscious of the fact of where you live, what you may have to do if you suddenly have a, a catastrophic fire develop in your neighborhood. What's the evacuation? Uh, the most important thing that we encourage people to do on our side is to get onto the web page, go in and register your cell phone and get on the, on the list there so that you can receive all the electronic information that we pump out. Within the structure of county government, we have a battery of people that we bring together and we start grabbing the information from the management process within the fire and we start pushing that out to the people so they know what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. And that's probably the most important thing because a lot of people don't and haven't registered their cell phones and they have no landline. We can hit a landline real easy through the 911 center and give a message. But people don't have landlines anymore, they rely on the cells. So get the cells uh, registered is probably one of the more important things you should live in a rural area. And then along those lines, I think Bob mentioned they're doing us. You're actually staging a mini back at Forest Lakes, right? What did we did you say? All right. It's going to be in May sometime. It'll be a Saturday in May, but we're, we're trying not to tip the residents that we're doing. Top secret. <laughs> I think I'd like to go there. It might be helpful to hear how this goes. Let's say there's an escape fire, like the Valley Fire, you might even use that as an example. What happens? To, how is the community made aware of that? What should they do? I'm kind of a fireman, so I have an evacuation plan on my refrigerator. I have all the boxes in my closet. Well, that's a really a good question. Uh, we all react differently when there's an emergency. Uh, I can think of many, many stories and instances that occurred during the Missionary Ridge. Uh, I saw people running into their homes and grabbing their parrot and their cat, leaving their wallet, money, insurance, papers, and things like that behind and fleeing. And quite honestly, some of those homes burned and those poor people had nothing. So I think as you have, uh, build a plan internally. Look at what you have, uh, where you are, and where you need to go. Be in tune with the Platte County. Uh, it got so bad during Missionary Ridge that we had our deputies going through with loudspeakers and sirens. Uh, we did that uh, at the north end of Fall Creek, and literally some people heard the siren. They were asleep on their couch taking a nap, and they heard the deputy come through the yard with a siren, and they raised up, and the fire literally came over the front deck, and they ran out the back door, got their car, and left with nothing but their shirt on their back. So I think that, I think that again, being conscious and building a plan, it's real, ladies and gentlemen, it's real this year. And we've got to start developing these plans, and people have to take it upon themselves to be more prepared than they have been. And being able to grab a box, or grab something that you've already assembled and put together and run for the door. Grab the cat, grab the dog. There's going to be mechanisms to take care of that too. But having all of that pre-planned and pre-packaged and ready to go out the door is the most important thing you can do. Does that help? What about pre-evacuation and evacuation? How much time is going to go out? Well, I, I, I even hate to talk about that because it, it, it just depends on the scenario. Uh, what we try to do is post uh, pre-evacuation notices when we have an idea that the fire is progressively moving into a particular area. We work with a management group from the fire scene and we try to figure out that geographic area that's probably going to be impacted. And we can systematically go ahead and dial in the landlines and give that out. When we do it on the electronic devices, we basically have to let everybody know. So 
we, we really do like to give notice to people. But sometimes if the fire's moving fast enough, we just don't have the time. And it's it's literally knocking on the door, grab the kid and run. And it's it, it's hard to say. We do like to do that pre evac process because that helps us, especially with traffic issues. Uh, people a lot of times will leave when we get the pre evac and the traffic is uh, the number of tra traffic counts are a lot lower and people get out of there earlier. When we evacuated the Forest Lakes, we had two and during two thousand two we had two lines of traffic coming down and trying to merge them back into one lane on 501 was a nightmare. So, as, in, as communities, taking that a little bit bigger, what do we do as a community thinking about uh, being prepared? Charlie, Matt? So, the, the big thing is self awareness. Um, you can plan a lot and, and you should have your personal go bag ready to go. You should know what you want to take. Um, you should run through that because people are always shocked when they pack these things up um, and actually have a stopwatch going how long it takes. Um, and you should know, you, you can prepare to a certain extent, but also there's a lot that you can't prepare for. And so it's really good to try to stay calm and be self-aware in these situations. Um, it's going to be inherently a stressful situation. You're not going to be calm no matter how hard you try. Um, but it, it's important to know things like, does your neighborhood have an evacuation route? Um, it's separate from the um, main way that you come in and out. Um, it's important to try to stay self-aware to the point where, okay, if the fire's coming from here, then um, I know that this evacuation route potentially could be cut off. Um, things like that. Ultimately, the goal is to have sheriff's deputies um, and, and county um, and fire department officials managing that evacuation, but um, you really want to make sure that you've played your role in knowing uh, it to as much as possible about the situation. Um, and really, that's where that prior preparation comes in. Um, another thing is, a lot of communities around here have locked gates that are part of their evacuation route, and I've been to many communities where nobody can tell me who has the key. Um, just simple things like that. Now, the um, fire officials and, and sheriff's deputies, they have a lot of fun tools to get through those things, um, but if you're trapped there, um, the last thing that we want to see is people trapped in a vehicle with a fire coming to overtake them. Um, so really, uh, it's engage with, the, engage with your fire department, um, understand what their, uh, uh, what what role they plan to play and what um, their understanding of your evacuation routes are and um, talk with organizations like Firewise or um, Emergency Management um, and, and make sure that we solidify these plans as much as possible. Don't wait until there's a fire. We have the luxury of time um, right now without the fire burning on the horizon and, and coming at us. So take advantage of it. Do your evacuation planning, get your bags ready, um, but also take advantage of the time that we have to, to do the fuel mitigation around your house. Talk to your neighbors, get a, get a neighborhood ambassador, talk to firewise, reach out to these folks in the community, reach out to forest service and other people who are willing to help you. Take it, so take advantage of that time. Um, there's a great example of the Deer Valley subdivision. They took advantage of the time that they had they put together a community wildfire protection plan. Um, once they got the plan uh, signed off and agreed to um, by their land management agencies, um, they were able to compete for a lot of grant money. And so it was the uh, uh, Upper Pine that went in there and helped them clear out all of the, I think it was 98% of the homeowners participated on their private land. When they got that done, that made it so much easier for the Forest Service to go right up to the fence line, put in a hand line, and do a prescribed fire right off of the fence line from that subdivision. We did it, we burned 1,100 acres. Um, we know we're gonna have to go back, but the, the, the neat thing about that is, is the community wanted us to do that. I mean, very solidly, that people raise their hands and say, fill my house with smoke for a couple days. Um, but they were asking us to do that, and, and they worked very, very closely with us to prepare, and we could do it safely, and we did. Um, I'll tell you, it's 
it's not very often in someone's career where you're standing on the front porch of a $700,000 home, literally 50 feet from the fence line, watching trees torch, knowing where the ones that put the fire on the ground. But it worked, and it, and it, and it worked safely. Oh, we have a question. And then, uh, Jim O'Kent, did you have anything to add to that? No? You guys ready? <laughs> We're, we can wrap it up. We'll just make sure people get a point. We're kind of getting to the end. One more question. Uh, um, one of the common themes for all your organizations is always resource constraint, right? Do you have any, are you thinking about any programs that volunteers that have saw experience that are just community members that are willing to go out on public lands and help? Um, is that anything that's on the horizon? Because I think there's a ton of people, especially in Durango, but even in my own neighborhood, Raptor J, a ton of lawyers that are willing to put in time and if we were going to volunteer and get the right foot on certification, guys, we would go out there and spend time to help mitigate versus you having to pay for it through our tax dollars or through limited budgets. So is anybody thinking about volunteer programs well, I can't say that I've heard of that. And, you know, we have companies in the area that charge for doing those services, and uh, but I think there'd be, I, I would guess, a, a number of communities that might want to take advantage of free help, like if you, you know, well, wanted to offer that. But you know, and it, safety would be an issue. But, you know, make sure that. Whoever's out there knows what they're doing and, and uh, don't start dropping trees on each other or throwing sparks into the dry grass. But uh, so, no, we haven't, I can't say we thought of that, but it's uh, an interesting idea. You know, I, I'd encourage people to start um, locally and start within their community and really work their way out. Um, you know, you said you live in Raptor J, and I um, have been in, up in Raptor J a number of times in the last few weeks. And I know that um, that community in, in particular, but really all the communities in this area, um, have a, still have a lot of work to get done. Um, you know, even Deer Valley Estate still um, can, can do more. It's an ongoing process where things grow back, and um, they're going to have to go and um, retreat some of these areas again. So. What we, one of the things that we really encourage people to do is have work days, um, community work days, and a community that was mentioned earlier that's been really effective at doing that is Falls Creek Ranch, where they've actually created um, kind of, it, it's, one, it's monthly work days, but they're some of the big events of the year in this community. And so they actually have people who will come from out of town, um, where it's their second home in Falls Creek Ranch, they'll come from out of town and they'll pick an area and basically say, all right, this is the area we're going through and mitigating. Um, and you know, I know other communities where they're choosing uh, people who might not be able to do the work themselves because they have disabilities or they're elderly um, or not comfortable felling you know, 100 and something foot ponderosa pines and bringing um, you know, people who are comfortable doing that over to their property and, and, and working on this. So, uh, I would, I would encourage people to really start this developing those community work days and really get together and you know maybe it's starting in Raptor J for example maybe it's starting by going 15 feet back on the roads because that's one of the things that um, I know really should be done throughout there and, and there's plenty of stuff to cut that way um, and start by doing that and then once you get done with that um, maybe there's some community land somewhere that you target or maybe you start um, reaching out to homeowners who need that help but I'd really encourage you to um, get involved with our ambassador in Raptor J um, and, and um, work towards those developing those community work days as an ongoing thing. Excuse me, Eric. But one thing I don't think we, we mentioned is we have a pretty good handout on creating defensible space zones around your home or other structures on your property. They're available on the back table to, to my left. And, uh, and these are good guidelines and but there's no guarantee. I mean, you do, you might do everything this recommends, and you can still lose your home. But I think your gambling odds are going to be a whole lot better, and so you're going to be a whole lot safer if if you can implement as many.